Every day when I wake up in the morning I see the sky and I think about the things that you've made All the beauty and your glory is showing yeah. It never bores me to look at the ocean The waves are crashing and the water spraying up in my face I look above and all the seagulls are soaring yeah. We've got to overcome the darkness so we don't get caught in the middle Between the hopeful and the heartless So Hello, good day, good morning I just can't stop smiling Because today is a brand new day And all the darkness and the pain Is just fading behind me Oh Lord, what a beautiful day All the planets surround me The way they orbit just boggles my mind The way the sun keeps on shining, yeah We've got to overcome the darkness So we don't get caught in the middle Between the hopeful and the heartless So, hello, good day, good morning I just can't stop smiling Cause today is a brand new day And all the darkness and the pain is just fading behind me Oh Lord, what a beautiful day There's nothing to fear, it'll be okay It's the day that the Lord has made it's the day that the Lord has made There's nothing to fear, it'll be okay It'll be okay It's the day that the Lord has made That the Lord has it's made It's the day that the Lord has made That the Lord has made So, oh, hello, good day, good morning I just can't stop smiling Cause today is a brand new day And all the darkness and the pain is just fading behind me Oh Lord, what a beautiful day Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Live with Doug. Come on in, come on in. There's plenty of room down here in the front. Take your seat. And we are going to look at this last chapter of Romans together. It is so good to think through God's word with you. I say we're going to look at Romans 16. We're not going to look at the whole thing. In fact, the more I have thought about it, I realize I do not want to rush through this. Because we shouldn't rush through this. Chapter 16 is just as important as the rest of the letter, at least from one or two perspectives. So we're going to take a look at that. Uh, good morning, Lewis and Megan, Rob Daly. Good afternoon, Dale says. Doug, you may have been confused about my not being in Greek yesterday because of some of the jokes and other references I've made. I did actually begin to take matters into my own hands slowly. Uh, oh, excellent, excellent. We'll keep on trucking and keep on trucking. Rob says he likes the tagline. <laughs> Great. So, uh, Romans 16. I, I, when we come to these portions of these New Testament letters, I think it is crucial that we go slowly and carefully through them from at least this perspective. You know, I'm always harping, almost every day it seems like, right? Harping on the fact that the New Testament and indeed the whole Bible is not a systematic theology book. We look at it as a book of doctrine in so many circles. It's not. Now, if you if you consider doctrine simply as teaching, which is what the word means, sure, there is there's a ton of teaching in it. So it, in that sense, it is a book of teaching and the Great Commission that we as we call it, right? Jesus told his apostles, "You guys go and uh, make disciples of the nations, teaching them." So teaching, yes, and that's what I'm doing with you here. But it's not a book of abstract theology 
where it's teaching the doctrine of this and the doctrine of that, which is what we tend to make it. And because we look at it that way, we kind of blow through these closing exhortations and descriptions of, of people. Here's why I think it's so important that we go kind of slow through this. Paul was a real man who was not a seminary lecturer. He was not a pastor standing up week after week after week giving a sermon. In fact, we don't see any example of that practice in the New Testament. He was not an academic. He wasn't writing books. We call this the book of Romans. And I do that all the time. It's not a book. It's a letter. Those are very different, aren't they? Epistle, that's simply the, the Greek word, which Dale, I'm sure, could tell us, the Greek word for a letter. This is the epistle to the Romans, not a book. What's the difference? Well, a book is usually trying to convey certain information or uh, persuade of a point of view, and it's not very personal. And the, the author may or may not have a specific occasion that is prompting him to write the book. It, it sort of transcends time because most authors set out to say, okay, I want to write this information and see if I can tease some people and it might be useful. As opposed to a letter, which certainly may include teaching and persuasion and that kind of thing, but it's, it's very personal, written from a person to another person or group of people. And our works in the New Testament are letters. They are not theology books. It's really important for us to grasp that as we interpret and study these things. But today, I want us, as we dig into the, the closing exhortations here, be impressed with the fact that Paul was a real man working hard for the cause. And he cared deeply about these Christians in Rome who were being influenced by bad teaching. But he so desperately wanted to go visit them and see them firsthand. And, and as he said in chapter one, be, be uh, blessed by them and, and you, for them to use their gifts for him and vice versa. And he is surrounded, probably in Corinth, he is surrounded by people who are working hard for the cause of Christ. And we're going to see all these relationships and all these, these real people in the first century. This, this, the gospel is true. It's real. Jesus really did walk this earth. And he died and rose again and empowered his followers, men who really did walk with him before his death and resurrection, and men who walked with him afterward, and women, I don't mean to be just exclusive to one sex here, men and women in the first century working hard for the cause of Christ. These are real people, real events, it's a real gospel. So as we go through this, keep that in mind. And, and let, me, let me frame it with this question. As we see how Paul described so many of his colleagues, his, his fellow workers and, and friends there in, uh, in Corinth, if that's where he was, and he, he speaks highly of them, it raises the question in my mind, what would he say about me? If he'd been hanging out here in Colorado Springs for the last year and we were serving together and then he wrote another church about me, what would he say? Would he commend Doug to you all and say these things about you? So let that settle in for you as we look at these things and be thinking, what? What reputation would you have with him if he were here? All right, so chapter 16, working, uh, looking at verse 1. 
Sorry, I saw Ken's <laughs> comment up there. I'm working, so I have to watch it later. Have a great time in the Word Saints. All right, so he says, and I commend you to Phoebe, our sister. We talked about this yesterday. Probably this is the person entrusted with the letter to take it to the Roman Christians there. And and this, I love this word commend in the Greek. It means to stand with, at least etymologically, that's what it means. He's basically saying, I stand with her to all y'all there in Rome. And commend is a good translation. Because the idea is, I want you to stand with her just like I do. She's our sister. Probably not biologically, genetically connected, but our sister in the faith, right? She is a servant of the assembly, the ecclesia, the church. She's a servant of the church that is in Chantria. She is, she is working hard to be a blessing, to be an encouragement, to, to serve our fellow believers uh, in Chantria. So receive her, he's going to go on to say, right? That you may receive her in the Lord. Well, what does that mean? Well, receive her worthily, worthily of the Holy One. She's a saint. She's one of those whom Daniel talked about that we looked at over the holidays. Daniel said the kingdom was going to belong to the saints. This is one of them. So receive her in a manner that is worthy of receiving a saint. And that you may assist her in whatever matter she may have need of you. So she's been serving these other folks in Chantria. Now I'm saying you assist her, you serve her and, and bless her in whatever matter she has needs, take care of her, right? For she also became a leader of many and of myself. All right, so this is one of those uh, uh, textual questions that I didn't get to yesterday because we ran out of time. Uh, let me show you here um, another, nope, that ain't it. There we go. Another translation. So I've got uh, the LSV, which I've been using here. It says, uh, for she also became a leader of many. And then you see the ESV says, for she has been a patron of of many and of myself as well. Those are rather different translations, aren't there? Aren't they? Leader or patron. So the word can mean both. The the Greek word here, it can mean uh, leader. It can be it's it's uh, a word that means to stand before, and often it means stand before a group of people as their leader but can also be stand before them in the sense of helping and especially providing. That's where the word patron comes from or uh, benefactor. And a benefactor or patron in ancient Greek culture could be someone who had a specific role in um, uh, a lobbyist and those kind of things come to mind, which are not not good words because we don't like lobbyists. At least uh, I don't like lobbyists uh, by and large. But the idea of uh, you're supporting someone financially in a certain role and therefore you have some influence over them. But it can also be more general. And I think that's what's being uh, intended here by Paul. So I don't think it's a leader. It doesn't make any sense that he would say she's become a leader of many and of myself. How, how would she be a leader of Paul? I, Paul makes it clear he's not uh, under anybody's leadership except the Lord. So I think it's patron. It's it's uh, basically she has provided financially. Apparently she's well off financially. Uh, and that's part of the reason she can afford to take this trip and deliver the, uh, the letter to uh, the Romans, I believe. And she's been a a provider for many. She's taken of her wealth and provided for many, including Paul. And so he's saying, look, she takes care of people here all the time. Y'all take care of her and assist her and and provide for her. Rob says, helper or benefactor uh, does the to you or you two in verse one matter? Um, Oh, I see, because uh, this translation says, I commend you to Phoebe. No, it's two different ways of saying the same thing. Um, in the Greek, it's, I commend or I stand with her to you. So the to you is, is definitely there in the Greek. 
Um, so yeah, the L LSV would have done better here to say, I commend to you, what's the NES? I commend to you, ESV, I commend to, yes, yeah, so they all get it right. So LS, the uh, literal standard for English would have been better to put a to U here. Yeah, good question. All right, so again, just this woman, Phoebe, she's generous. And, the, and Paul says, I am happy to stand. I do stand with her and I'm encouraging you to stand with her and, and provide for her and so on. I, I love that. All right. Uh, greet Priscilla and Aquilus. We see them in other New Testament book uh, letters, right? Uh, my fellow workmen in Christ Jesus. Uh, so this is a husband and wife team and, and he says, greet them. So they're in Rome there. Uh, who laid down their own neck for my life. We don't know where or how, but this couple uh, risked their life for Paul, which is really cool, uh, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the assemblies of the nations. So whatever work they are doing with Paul, all the churches, this is again, Ecclesia, all the churches of the, of the nations, they owe their thanks here to this couple. Are there nations that owe thanks to you? Now, things were different then, of course. The movement was much smaller. <laughs> so I don't really mean to compare any of us to them. But are we getting after it in such a way that somebody looks at us and says, their work is having a broader impact. Do you see how different this is from showing up to a building on Sunday morning and attending a service, and maybe being part of a men's ministry or women's ministry or a youth program or nursery or some you know program and then going about your life? These people were engaged and involved and other people knew it. Am I trying to convict you? Yeah, a little bit. Because <laughs> I'm convicted and I want you to be convicted. And he says, the greet uh, or give thanks to the assembly at their house or they are uh, doing stuff for the assembly at their house. Home fellowship. I will move on. Greet Epinetus, my beloved. So this person was dear to Paul, who is first fruit of Achaia to Christ. Now, this is the better manuscripts say Asia, Asia Minor. This guy, uh, Epinetus, uh, was the first convert in Asia Minor, present-day Turkey. And Paul lists him and says, greet him. So these are either part of the entourage that are going with the letter to Rome or uh, they're in Rome. That's part of what's interesting about this, trying to figure that out. Greet Mary, who labored much for us. Greet Andronicus and Hunius. We talked about them yesterday. My relatives and my fellow captives who are of note among the apostles, who also have been in Christ before me. So these two uh, were Christians before Paul was. Greet Amplius, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Arbanus, our fellow workman in Christ. And Stachus, my beloved, greet Apelles, the approved in Christ. Don't you want him to write that about you? He's been approved, he's been tested and, and pro uh, proven. Greet those of the household of Aristobulus. Greet Herodian, my relative. And again, you just, I, I, we don't know for sure. Are these true family members of Paul's family? Is that why he calls them out as relatives? Or is this another term of endearment? My beloved, my relative, I don't know. Greet those of the household of narcissist. Are some Christians narcissists? Yeah. <laughs> who are in the Lord. Greet Tryphania and Tryphosa who are laboring in the Lord. Greet Persis, the beloved, who labored much in the Lord. This word labor shows up a few times in the New Testament. It means to be exhausted, to grow weary. This man, Persis, his 
work for what Paul was doing was so intense that he was worn out. Have you ever, ever been worn out for the cause of Christ? Greet Rufus, the chosen one in the Lord. What, what does that mean? Is he just again using a, a label that's true of all of us, but applying it to him, the chosen one? Or is there some other emphasis there? I don't know. Uh, so greet him and his mother and mine. Is Rufus Paul's brother? Or is this another term of endearment of the Christian family? I, I tend to think likely all of this is different ways of describing Christians as family. Which, again, I love that. We, it's easy to throw out the, the, the verbiage, brother so-and-so, my sister, my mother, kind of thing. But it's another thing to really have the affection for other Christians of a brother, sister, mother, daughter kind of thing. And, and, and you can't just do that um, without spending time together, without really being engaged like a family with one another. You don't do this going to a service once in a while or once a week. Greet Asyncritus and Phlegon, Hermas, Petrobos, Hermes. So any of you who are uh, going to have a son anytime soon, here's a great list to choose some names from. And the brothers with them, greet Philog Philologus and Julius, Nereus and his sister and Olympus and all the holy ones with them. Greet one another in a holy kiss or probably by a holy kiss. The assemblies of Christ greet you. So he's saying all of us back here, the, the church, the gathering of Christ, they all greet you and you greet one another uh, by a holy kiss. There are differences of opinion on what that holy kiss looked like, what it was. Is it the uh, sort of European kiss today or a kiss on both cheek, that kind of thing? And uh, then sometimes I get asked, you know, are we... Supposed to practice that today. It's one of those customs that seems to me that the intent of the custom is more important than the specific action. So in our day, a handshake or a hug. And if you are properly in tune with sexual dynamics, it is the side hug, man to woman. <laughs> As you can probably tell by my laughter, I think that may be a little bit um, unnecessary at times. Anyway, whatever it is, the point is, as Christians, there is an affection. And expressions of the affection are what families do. And, and I, I'm only half kidding about the side hug. We can become... I mean, a, a kiss obviously can be sexual in nature, but it's not always. And so a hug, same kind of thing. Uh, we, we don't, we can go overboard and be so afraid of acting improperly that we miss this, this uh, human touch of people who care about one another. And Paul says, greet one another, whatever the greeting is, handshake, whatever, that's fine. But we should extend to other believers, especially in our, uh, in our, you know, the circles we run in, we, we should extend a message that says, we are family. I care for you and you care for me. Now, Rob says, washing others' feet. I think that's quite different. Uh, that was only done once, and I'm not sure that the intent there is that we always practice that. I, I mean, yes, Paul says, go, or uh, Jesus says, go and do likewise, but in that setting, 
the apostles did not wash Jesus' feet. In fact, uh, that's the whole point. Jesus, that was an act of humility that had a very specific message to be sent. I don't think we're supposed to go around washing each other's feet. We're to have the attitude of serving each other and not looking at anyone, pastor, elder, uh, someone who gives a lot financially to the church. We're not supposed to put any of those people on a pedestal and say, oh, I'm unworthy to be around them. They are better Christians than me. They are No, none of that. But the affection is a different expression. Rob says, could it be something of an adaptation, washing feet, turn to kiss? I don't think so. I think they're communicating two very different things. Uh, the washing of the feet, I think, is an act of humility that I don't outrank you. And even if I do, I'm not going to use that as a reason to refuse to serve you. Whereas the kiss is just a general, hey, we love one another. Which is, again, more like the hug, the handshake. We, we are, uh, we are, uh, we are closely related here kind of thing. So that, that's how I see it. So give this some thought. And if, if your group of believers that you fellowship with, your church, if, you know, is it, the, is it the kind of group that has this sort of love and relationship? And are you getting things done for the kingdom? And if Paul were writing about you and others in your church, would he write these kind of things? Or would it be more... Um, you know, they have very lively music uh, and great preaching on Sunday. We don't, we don't see any of that kind of thing in the New Testament, but we see this kind of love and, and labor in the Lord for building the kingdom. And that's not just building the quote-unquote institutional church. It's uh, preaching the gospel and, and impacting each other so we impact the world for Christ and all that. So anyway, I, I find all of this to be... Um, uh, encouraging and motivating and, and challenging to think about the work that I'm doing and, and who we are as a fellowship. And I would encourage you to give that some thought too. All right, I'm going to call it a day there. We will come back on uh, Monday and continue working through Romans 16. Tomorrow's Friday. So we've got free form Friday. We got some fun things to talk about there. Have a great Thursday. God bless you. See you tomorrow.